Welcome to this, uh, the final lecture in the course. Uh, there is also um, one, if you look at the schedule, it says a lecture on Thursday, but that's a Q&A session, questions. You ask questions about the things I haven't managed to explain, and then I'll try to explain them more clearly, uh, or anything else you need to ask about. Uh, we had looked last time about, we had looked at um, uh, three address code, how the compiler first translates the program to yet another representation, uh, three address code, where each instruction in the code has three addresses. It can be, uh, you add two numbers and put the result in the third place. Or you can have uh, a conditional jump where you compare two numbers and if the comparison is true, you jump to address number three. Uh, that those instructions are a bit like what you would expect uh, the machine instructions in, a, in, in an actual physical CPU to look like. Uh, <coughs> we also said that the reason for uh, translating to this type of intermediate code is for the compiler to work with those three address instructions. And we saw some simple optimizations that could be done. If you have something plus zero, well, you can remove that instruction, for example. And we also talked about flow graphs. Uh, if you have a number of three address instructions, you group them into basic blocks where you don't have any jumps into or out of the block, except maybe to the start or out from the last line. So you know when you look at the instructions in a basic block that they will be performed in order. And all of them will be performed. And we were going to look at a, a bigger example of optimization of three address code. Do you remember quicksort? <laughs> You have um, an array with numbers 7, 9, 1, 86, 2, 44, 3, minus 1, 0. Any, you don't need to write down the numbers, it's just an example. Uh, then uh, you uh, take one of the numbers, it could be the one in the middle or it could be anything. And then you start moving numbers around from each end. Uh, so every number that is bigger than this one goes there, to the right, and every one that is smaller to the left. So if you look at uh, 7 and 0, well, 7 is bigger than 2, and 0 is smaller than 2. So let's switch those around. And then you move inwards until you uh, <coughs> cannot switch anymore. And what you've done then is you have partitioned the array into two parts. One where each number is smaller and one where each number is bigger. Okay? And then you recursively call quicksort on each of those arrays. And if we look at <coughs> the code, can you read this code? Uh, it is a recursive function. Uh, you assume you have an array, A, which, um, well, it doesn't really matter how, where, it, where it starts and where it ends. Uh, if it's C, you know it's uh, something like this, uh, of uh, integers, and the interesting part here is this part here that's been marked with bold uh, text. I don't know if it's very visible. Oh, it starts here. Uh, let me check it out. V. 
Veritans. This is the port where you start at each end of the array. Uh, <coughs> and since it's going to be called recursively, you have index M and index N, which uh, defines the port of array you want to sort. And you start with index I at one end and index J at the other end. And then you do this loop that flips, uh, sw uh, swaps numbers. So we get this semi-sorted array with one smaller part and one larger part. Uh, you have a, an outer loop and two inner loops. And each inner loop steps uh, towards the middle from the left and from the right. And when the indexes i and j have uh, met, you jump out of the loop with this break statement that means jump out of the loop. And it's all gone. Uh, and it's really not that important exactly how quicksort works. Uh, what's important is how this is then translated to three address code. If we take this part, the interesting part, there. Here you have three address code, and if you remember, it started with set i to m minus 1, copy n to j, and so on. Uh, <coughs> these are three address instructions, and what might be interesting to look at is uh, this port here. If you remember the code that we recently saw, you had something like um, v is set to a n, like this. Okay? And you may remember what we said last time. If you have addresses, let's say an array starts at address 1000, and you have integers, then integers are typically four bytes long. They take up 32 bits, which, are, which is usually four bytes, four times eight. Uh, is 32, and so the first uh, element in the array is, of course, at address 1000. The second is at 1004, and the third will be at 1008. So to get the correct address, you need to multiply n by 4. And that is what happens here. You start by <coughs> creating this temporary variable, t1, which is 4 times n, and then you use that one for array indexing. Uh, this shows us maybe already now that there will be optimizations that cannot be done on the C level. You need to work on this level that's one level below C code because this multiplication by 4, you don't see it at all here. Okay, let's um, divide this into basic blocks and let's um, try some simple things if I remove this part. Uh, which jumps do we have? Well, we have one jump here, so one basic block will end uh, after instruction number 8, because you remember we can have jumps only out of the final line of the block. We have a jump back to 5, so that means one basic block will start at line 5, because we can have jumps into the block only if it's to the first line. Uh, you have uh, a jump here, and you have a jump to line 23 over here from this one. Uh, do we have any more jumps? Yeah, here. You have go to 5, which jumps over there. So now, when we have looked at all 
the jumps in the code, we can split it into basic blocks. We see that, okay, these four instructions will always be run in order, so that's one basic block. Uh, we will see that, <coughs> we will see at this part here, <coughs> those instructions will always be done in order. Uh, we have uh, this part here, also always done in order. Uh, this block here, well, that will be just one single line. And why is that? Well, uh, <coughs> since we have a jump out there, uh, and this line is also a jump, then we're not sure if anything more than only this line will be run in order. I mean, we could jump out here, so uh, we might not continue from this line to this line, uh, and we might jump out. So this basic block is just that single line. Then we have um, this part, which continues all the way here. So line 14 to 22 is one basic block. And finally, line 23, uh, 3 to 30 is one basic block. So by looking at the jumps, you can identify the basic blocks. If we look at <coughs> uh, the flow graph, and I call this block block number one, I call this block number two, block number three, block number four, block number five, and block number six, just to order them in order. Uh, if we look at the jumps, we have block one, which always continues to block number two. You don't have a jump out here. Uh, in block two, you can jump back to, no correction, to the start of the same block. But it's a conditional jump, so you can also continue to the next block, which is block number three. And again, at the end of block number three, you can jump back to the start of the same block, like this, or you can continue to uh, this short block that we have called number four. And that block either continues directly to block number five, or it is a jump to block number six. And this final jump at line 22 in block number five, back to the start of block two here. Uh, creates the outer loop. You remember we talked about inner loops and outer loops, and, well, clearly this is an outer loop, and these two are two inner loops. And you can see them if um, <coughs> I scroll up here to the source code. Uh, Well, this while loop here is the big outer loop, and you have these two short 
inner loops here. Okay. So, let's continue working with uh, mostly block number five. Uh, because we can do two types of optimizations here. Uh, what we call local optimizations, where we work with one single block and move things around in that block or remove things from the block. And what we call global optimizations, where we <coughs> take into account what happens in the other blocks too, and maybe we can move something out of a block to another block. For example, if you have something that's done at the beginning of this block here, in the inner loop. Well, if we can move that out of the block, maybe there, so it's not done once for each iteration, but only once, then we have optimized the code. It will be faster. Uh, and also note that global does not mean global in the ent entire program. We look at one function at a time. Okay? Block 5, which I showed you just before, <coughs> it looked something like this. T6 is set to 4 times i. Uh, X was set to um, A. T6, you remember this, times 4. Uh, T7 was set to 4 times i. T8 was set to 4 times j. T9 to a index t9. a index t7 was set to t9. Uh, T10 was set to 4 times j. A index T10 was set to x. And finally we have a go to at the end of the block. Go to block 2. Okay, you agree? So, let's see which local optimizations can we do in this block. Do you see any obvious ones? Um, T6 and T7 are the same Yes. I mean, this, these are the same. And I hasn't changed between them. And if you look at T8, this 4 times J and this 4 times J, these are also the same. And again, this is not something we could do on the C level. We need to look at what happens below that level, because this 4 times was not present in the source code at all. So, what do we do? Well, <coughs> if we remove this one, uh, then we will obviously get a problem here. But uh, we should instead use T6. So I remove this one and use T6 instead. And then exactly the same thing with T8 and T10. I remove this setting of T10 and use uh, T8 instead. So this is what we call removing or eliminating common sub-expressions, 4 times i and 4 times j. Okay? If I uh, redraw it so we see what we're doing, we have... Uh, T6, we have T8 is 4 times 
i. We have t9 is a index t9. We have um, a t6 is set to t9. We have a t8 is set to x. And we have the same go to b2 at the end. Oh, correction, j, 4 times j. And I made a mistake there too, t8, right? Is it correct now? Yeah, now we have this uh, this basic block, and we can't yet, at least, remove anything more. But maybe we can look at the other basic blocks and see if something has been calculated before. So maybe we can remove some non-local sub-expressions. And if we go back to... Now I need to pull down this one. Uh, this is the same flow graph, but with the code in it. So if you can read this... Uh, <coughs> If I look at 4 times i, and here we have basic block 5, the one we've been working with. Uh, if I look at 4 times i here, and 4 times j, I've already optimized away uh, the duplicates here. Uh, <coughs> if I look upwards here in the graph, then I see that, oh, here. I calculated 4 times j. And up here I calculated 4 times i. Uh, <coughs> and to check that those numbers have actually been calculated and that they are still valid, I need to check that j hasn't changed since uh, we calculated 4 times j, and the possible ways execution could have moved is this way. Okay, j hasn't changed here until we get here. Uh, if we go back up here, then yes, we changed j, but then we calculate a new t4 equals 4 times j. So the value in t4, which is 4 times j, will have used the correct j, because then we have a new j, uh, t4 based on the new j, and then we get here to our calculation. So we could actually reuse t4 for 4 times j. And the same with 4 times i. Uh, up here we put 4 times i in t2, and I hasn't changed anywhere until we get here. And also t2 doesn't change. We know this because we don't reuse these temporary variables. Uh, t2 is set to 4 times i. And again, we could have jumped back here, but then we, after we changed i, we calculate a new t2. So when we get here, we can use t2 for 4 times i, and we can use t4 for 4 times j. <coughs> okay. Say again. T2 doesn't change, no. And it's based on i, but i doesn't change after T2 has been calculated. 
So, you remember we had uh, T2 and we had T4. So instead of 4 times i, uh, we can use T2 and instead of 4 times j, we can use T4. So remove this instruction and use T2 instead. And instead of this instruction, uh, use T4 instead of T8. And then I can use them. I need, of course, to use them down here also. So instead of uh, T6 and T8, here I also use T2 and T4. Okay, but to do these optimizations I need to look at the other basic blocks and I also need to look at what we can call flow of data. How uh, first flow of execution, the way we move between blocks and also where have they, these values been set, these variables been set. So uh, data sort of flows downwards in this flow graph. Okay, we can simplify B5 again. To x is set to a index t2. Uh, t9 is set to a index t4. And a index t2 is set to t9 and a index t4 is set to x and we have the same go to b2 at the end as we had before. I could ask you now as some sort of a, a check, couldn't we have uh, replaced this, these two instructions with one because t9 is clearly just a temporary variable. I put a t4 in t9 and then I put t9 into a index t2. Couldn't I have done something like this? Is my question. Could I have done that? No. Why not? Yeah, then it's not a three address instruction, then it's a four address instruction. So this would not be possible. Okay, again, can we do some more uh, non-local optimizations? Because I don't think we have any more local optimizations here. Well, look at the flow graph again. And <coughs> you remember that the first instruction here says do something with a t2 and now it's off again. Let's see if I can change the timeout here so it doesn't turn off the screen all the time. So now it should not turn on the screensaver. Uh, <coughs> you remember the first instruction in block 5 now after we've optimized it is x is set to a copy of a index t2. And a index t2, can that be used earlier? Well, here in block number two, you see that we calculate a index t2. We also need to check that T2 hasn't changed since we did this, because then we would have another place in the array. But as we said, we don't reuse temporary variables, and we can check that it has not changed. Uh, and also, one more thing needs to not have changed. Namely what? A. Yeah, the array A. If the contents of A has changed, then maybe a index t2 now contains something else. 
So we need to see that we haven't done anything to the array A, but we haven't done that. We've taken a copy here of one of the elements in it, but we have not uh, changed the contents of the array. So T3 here contains A index T2, and we can reuse that. Uh, another thing we are using here is A index T4 in uh, our optimized block here. And again, A index T4 is calculated here. And after this line until we get here, T4 has not changed and A has not changed. So we could replace A index T2 and A index T4 with T5 and T3. So let's do that. So A here we can use T3. And here we can use, was it T5? I think it was T5, right? T5. So block 5 now turns out to be x is set to T3, T9 is set to T5. Uh, A index T2 is set to T9. Uh, A index T4 is set to X. And the final go to B2. So we've done local elimination of uh, common sub expression uh, and we've done global elimination of common sub expressions. Another thing that we can do is what we call copy propagation. That means when we use a copy of something, such as here we copy the content of T5 to T9, and then we use T9, which is just a copy of T5. Well, let's not do that. Let's instead use the original. So instead of T9 here, I use T5 which is the original. Then, when I've done copy propagation, use the original instead of the copy, then maybe I can also eliminate T9. Because is T9 used again? No, it's not. So, remove that line. So we have, remove, we have removed common sub expressions. <coughs> hmm. We've done copy propagation. And then we've eliminated dead code. You remember that we said that dead code sometimes means code that never will be executed. But in this context, we, by dead code, we mean code that calculates values, sets variables that will not be used again. So eliminating dead code is the third optimization we've done. And again, to eliminate dead code, to know which variables will not be used again, we need to look at the other basic blocks. We can't do this local in a block because then uh, <coughs> we could el eliminate maybe the array A completely here because after this one it's not used again. So we need to look at the other blocks. Will this code be used? So finally, B5. Uh, shrinks from all this to just four lines. 
x is set to t3, a index t2 is set to t5, uh, a index t4 is set to x, and the go to, like this. Or can we do something more? Are we finished? I said that the array A is not dead. Uh, it will, I mean, the entire purpose of this, this code is to sort the array A so we can throw it away. But do we have any other variables here that maybe could be eliminated? X, X exactly. If we look again at the um, uh, flow graph, we see that x, well x is just, if you look at this code here, you have, uh, what, what does this code do? Well, you have a uh, index t2 and index t5, and what you do is you have a variable x, you take the contents of a t2, uh, move it there, uh, then you take the contents of this one and put, th put it there, and then you, from x, copy back there. So, this is a swap. It switches places on the contents of this and this place in the array. And x is just a temporary variable where you put, uh, I mean, if you need to switch places of two cars on two parking spots, you need a third parking spot to put one of the cars. That's the variable x. So maybe we could use copy propagation here. Instead of copying x, uh, copying t3 to x and then using x, we use the original t3. So now uh, t3 is used instead of x. And it turns out that x is not used anymore in this block. And if you look at, uh, as I said, if you look at the flow graph and all the other blocks, x is not used at all. So we can eliminate the variable x. We can eliminate this piece of dead code. So finally, 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 uh, a index t2 is set to t5. A index T4, did I do it correctly? T4. Yes, and this one is T3, and go to B2. So, three lines, which might look a bit strange because don't we need to make a copy here, but we did that in a previous block, so we don't need to do it again. Okay, questions? Is it on uh, machine, are we still in machine independent? Yes, this is machine independent code, even though this code, this three address code, is more similar to machine instructions on an actual machine than uh, it's close to the source code. And machine independent um, for phase will be implemented by us programmers? Well, by us programmers who write the yeah, compiler, the compiler. So, in uh, this is done automatically by the optimization phase in the compiler. Yes, yes. Okay, fifteen minutes break. All right, <laughs> let us continue with optimization. And in this uh, uh, case, loop optimizations. You remember we said that. Okay, if we have some instruction, uh, some instruction up here, yeah, nice to optimize it, but more interesting is to optimize things inside a loop, and especially an inner loop. 
which might be done, performed millions of times instead of just once. So what kind of loop optimizations can we do? Well, <coughs> one thing is to move code out of the loop. If you have an instruction here and it can be moved to B1, well, nice, do it. Uh, we might also be able to, what the book calls, eliminate induction variables. And what's an induction variable? Well, it's an extra loop variable. Induction in the sense that you increase it or uh, increment it or something for each iteration of the loop. Extra loop variables. And uh, what the book again calls reduction in strength of operations. That is, replace an expensive operation such, such as multiplication with a cheaper, that is, faster uh, operation, such as plus. So, reduce strength of <coughs> operations. Yeah. If we start by looking at moving code out of the loop, and now I will show it as C code here. Uh, in reality, it's not done on the source code level. The optimizer works with, with three address code or something like that. If we have... Uh, no, don't this one. If we have a while loop, let's say while i is less than limit minus 2. Ah, I need to delete this one. And in each iteration of the loop, you set a index i plus plus. So you increment i uh, <coughs> to, let's say, x plus y. This loop. Do you see something that could be moved out of the loop? What can be moved out of the loop? Does everything have to be done in each iteration? X plus y. Mm. Yeah, x plus y. X and y does not seem to change. So those could be re removed, or moved rather. And another thing. Limit minus 2. Limit doesn't change and 2 doesn't change. So we could use one temporary variable that is t1, which is limit minus 2, and t2, which is just x plus y. And then the loop itself becomes while i is less than t1, uh, a index i++ plus plus is set to t2. What about this loop? For int i is set to zero as long as i is less than str, str len of the string s, and then plus plus i in each iteration. And what we do is we uh, copy from the string s to the string s copy. What about this one? In the str len could be outside with a, with a variable. Yeah. Uh, 
This is something that's maybe a bit hard for the compiler to do for us, actually. Since this is a function call. And if the compiler knows that strlin uh, length strlin uh, calculates or returns the length of the string s, and if the compiler also can determine that s doesn't change, that the contents of the string s doesn't change. I mean, s copy and s could be overlapping, so it needs some advanced analysis to to realize that s does if s doesn't change. Uh, it might be hard for the compiler to know that this is, um, is something that could be pre-calculated. Because otherwise it doesn't know that, okay, maybe the value of strlin changes. But if we assume that, we can do this optimization call strlin first. And then use n in the loop for int i is that to zero, i is less than n plus plus i, and the same loop body s copy i is set to s index i, like this. But this might be uh, something you have to do depending on uh, how well the optimizer can analyze your program. This might have this might be something that you need to do uh, as a programmer on the C source code level. Because what is the uh, time complexity of these two versions of the loop if we assume that we actually call strlin? You remember this ordo ordo Well, this one goes through the string once and then it goes through the string once again to do the, uh, perform the copy. So if the length of the string doubles, the time will double. So you have ordo n, linear time complexity. But this one, if the length of the string doubles, well, <coughs> In each iteration of the loop, you call strlin. So for each character in the string, you need to go through the entire string to calculate its length. So you get ordo n squared, squared time complexity. Okay. This is about moving things out of the loop. Let's look at induction variables. Uh, another code, code snippet, i is set to zero, j is set to one, as long as a index, correction, a one index i, as long as a1 index i is not zero. So a1 could be a string. We set a2 index j to be a copy of a1 index i. And plus plus j and plus plus i to increment them. So what does this do? Well, if you have the array a1 here and the array a2 here, since i, which we use to index array a1, starts at 0, and j, which we use to index array a2, uh, starts at 1, we will copy everything one place higher in A2 from A1. Okay. If we look at I and J, both of them are used as some sort of loop counters here, loop variables. 
that is induction variables. We increment them with, with one in each step. Uh, do we need to do that? Do we need actually to have two variables now? I mean, j is always uh, before the loop and after each iteration, j is one higher than i. So we could replace j with i plus one. So remove j here, uh, change this to i plus 1, and then we don't need to increment j. So we have um, saved as one loop variable. When it comes to reduction of strength of the operations, we will go back to uh, our quicksort example and look at uh, one of the loops there. Uh, we will be able to both remove one induction variable and reduce the strength of the operations. Uh, if you remember the block B3. Uh, it's the loop that sets j to uh, one on the end of the array and then moves it inwards towards the other end. We had t4 is set to 4 times j, because again, 4 bytes per integer. We had t5, which was set to a index t4. And we have a, uh, had a conditional jump here. If t5 is greater than the variable v, which is the one we choose to uh, um, what's it called? The pivot, the variable that contains the value that <coughs> will divide the array into smaller and larger numbers. Uh, if it's bigger than v, go to b3. So this is a jump back. Now. Here we have the array, A. We uh, <coughs> are interested in position J. And then we move backwards, minus one, minus one, minus one, until we get to uh, the end condition. And we do that first by subtracting one from J, and then multiply J by four. Okay, but what if we instead had a variable, let's call it um, uh, x, and we just subtract 4. Instead of subtracting j, j uh, subtracting 1 from j and multiplying by 4 we'd have x and we subtract 4 in each iteration i mean both j and t4 are induction variables uh, they will move in lockstep so to speak uh, except that t4 is calculated anew each uh, iteration and it's four times larger. It's always four times larger. So what we could do is first up here somewhere we must give a starting value to uh, our x or we can use t4 since that's the one that will be used here. So if I use the blue, the blue pen. I set t4 to be 4 times 
J. And then here, instead of T4 is 4 times J, I just subtract 4 from uh, J, because that's what will be will be the equivalent value, because here I use j minus 1 and then times 4. So here I can say t4 is set to t4 minus 4. And now j is not used for anything. At least not in this block. So, we might need to do something about j later, but here we remove j completely and just use t4 is decreased by 4 in each iteration of the loop. But we must have a starting value. We must set t4 to something to start with. So, in a previous block, we must calculate t4 is 4 times j. Uh, we can put it in block b1, actually, uh, at the end of block b1, since uh, J has been calculated there. So in B1, we can add this uh, uh, T4 equals, uh, is set to 4 times J. And now we have both eliminated J uh, <coughs> from this block and we have also reduced this multiplication operation to the cheaper uh, subtraction, which, well, we just assume it's cheaper uh, on a modern CPU with uh, pipelined execution of, of uh, uh, <coughs> numerical calculations, it might not be much faster at all. Almost works, because if I turn on the projector and we look at the uh, we look at what happens after this b3 block uh, in the b4 block or block number 4 <coughs> in block number 4 i'm actually using j and i and i eliminated uh, J in this block, and I can eliminate I in the same way in block number two. So I and J are not dead yet. So what do I do about that? Well, <coughs> you could, if, or rather the optimizer could, if it's really smart, uh, recognize that, well, T4 is 4 times J, and t2 is 4 times i. So the condition that i is greater than or equal to j is equivalent to that 4 times, no correction, uh, <coughs> t4 divided, which one was it? Uh, T4, T2. T2 divided by 4 should be greater than or equal to T4 uh, divided by 4. And mathematically, this will be the same thing as T2 is greater than or equal to T4. So we don't really need I and J in this condition. We can use T2 and T4 even there. Which leads us to, let's see if I <coughs> can scroll down to 
the final flow graph after all these optimizations. This one, and you see both the previously rather big blocks B5 and B6 have been reduced to just three lines each. Okay, questions about this? Good. Well, you will have <coughs> opportunities to ask questions later if you are overwhelmed by the, the beauty of these transformations. So, let's now look at a fourth loop optimization, which is called loop unrolling. And I've said before that optimization does not mean that we transform the program to something that is an optimal in, uh, in some sense, but rather better in the sense that it's faster and or smaller, less executable code. Uh, typically, it's AND. I mean, if you have an instruction like A is set to B plus 2, uh, C is set to B times 1, uh, <coughs> you can remove this times 1. So you get shorter code, and since it does fewer operations, it will be faster. It will be uh, both smaller and faster. But sometimes, there is <coughs> uh, optimizations that you can do that will make the code faster, but not smaller, maybe bigger instead, or smaller but slower. And one such operation that makes the code bigger but faster is loop unrolling. And again, I'll show this on the C code level, even though the optimizer will not work on the uh, source code level. It will work on the, uh, for example, three address code uh, level. I have a loop that says for i is set to zero, uh, run it 20 times, increment in each iteration, and then I have an inner loop that says for j is set to zero, uh, j is set to, no, correction, as long as j is less than two. So this inner loop is just run twice, or two iterations. The entire loop is run once for each iteration of the outer loop, uh, plus plus j. And in here I have an array called a, which is two-dimensional, so I have index i and index j, and I set it to i plus two times j. So what we have is the array a, which is um, two-dimensional, it's 20 times two, and I will set each place to i plus 2 times j. Well, if i is 0, then it's 0. If it's j, then is 1, then it will be 2. Here it will be uh, i1. Yeah, something like that. It is initialization of a, uh, uh, a two-dimensional array or matrix. If we start by looking at this inner loop, well, it's run two iterations. And what if we remove those, this loop and replace it by those two iterations? 
a index i and in the first iteration j is zero so we can use i plus two times zero which of course is just i so I just can use i there and then in the second iteration of this inner loop we set a index i one because j is now one to i plus well two times one which is the same as saying just i plus two so so this will be the new or rather replacement of the inner loop so this is the new body of the outer loop and this might be a bit more code yes uh, <coughs> or maybe not because you remember for a loop uh, you require a couple of labels you have uh, a loop variable that needs to be tested and incremented you need to uh, jump back and you jump to the end after the loop so it's quite a lot of work that doesn't have to be done anymore when you just do this so now you've unrolled the inter inner loop unroll and you can also unroll the outer loop the big loop The first iteration, if we use this unrolled inner loop, this version, uh, the first iteration says a index i, which is zero in the first loop, uh, zero is set to, well, i is zero in the first iteration. Then the second line of the unrolled inner loop is a i, which is zero. Uh, uh, index 1 is set to i plus 2 and i is 0 so it's 2 and then comes the next iteration of this outer loop a index 1 and 0 is set to i which is 1 a index 1 index 1 is set to i which is 1 plus 2 which is 3 and the third iteration then you get to 2 0 which is 2 and this will be 4 all the way down to the final line which is 19 because if you loop 20 times and start with 0 the final one will be 19 uh, 1 and that will be 19 plus 2 which is 21 so so now you have unrolled both loops you probably have more code more executable code but it will be faster because you just run through it without all the jumps back and forth and without the loop variables so this is loop unrolling. You don't have to unroll the complete loop. You could, <coughs> if you have, let's say, 1000 iterations, you might not want to unroll all 1000 iterations. You could unroll 10 iterations and then run that 100 times instead of uh, looping 1000 times. Okay. And a smart compiler might even <coughs> uh, just realize that this is a block of data and just compile the block of data and put it in an in initialization block. So it doesn't need to run any instructions at all. Okay. Uh, another optimization that's not really a loop optimization, but that is 
uh, related to loops is elimination of tail recursion. So let's look at that. What is tail recursion? Well, that is when you have a function that calls itself as its final, uh, the final thing it does. So, if you have a linked list, like this, and you want to, let's say, um, just set all the elements to 3. You can do it recursively, or you can do it as an iteration where you move a pointer in a loop. If you do it recursively with the function f, uh, <coughs> you get a pointer to the first node, the pointer p points here. What do you do? Well, you set p pointer data, let's say it's the element is called data, you set it to 3, and then you can call the function f with p pointer next, if we assume that the next pointer in each struct is called next. Okay? Or if you did it as a loop, How would it look then? Oh, I forgot something. What did I forget? Uh, check if it's not yeah. I need, before I call it recursively, or before I do anything at all, I need to check if p is not null, then I do all this. Because otherwise I will never end the recursion. So I start when I get into the function to check if p is null, do nothing, otherwise set to 3 and call recursively with the next. Uh, here in the iterative version, while p is not null, what do I do? Well, I set p data to 3, just like I did uh, there. And I set p to point to the next item like this. This is the iterative version just loop through the list. Now, a good compiler that performs tail recursion can look at this and see that, okay, we will have activation records. I will call this function, here's the stack. I will call this function, I will have an activation record uh, <coughs> with p, which first will point to the first, then I will call the function recursively, so I will have a new activation record for p, uh, for f, which points at the next one, and so on, until I get to the end of the list, and then I will just return. But I'm not going to do anything at all at the end here. I will just return, and when I get to the end I will return from this one, return from this one, return from this one. So I don't really need to keep all these activation records. I can reuse the first one. So when I recursively call f from f, I just reuse the same activation record. I just move p forwards. Similar to what happens in this version, where I have a pointer p and just uh, I as a programmer moves it forward in the list. So this is elimination of tail recursion. Transform the tail recursion to a loop. Okay. Uh, there are a few more things <coughs> about optimization I would have liked to say. Uh, for example, how to debug optimized code. I mean, if the optimizer removes a lot of code, and then you step through it in the debugger. Okay, then you stepped into the code that has been removed. What should the, optimize, what should the, uh, what should the debugger show you? 
Should it just say that, oh, suddenly you're not up here, you just jumped down here in the code? And if a variable has elim been eliminated and you try to look at the value of the variable and there is no such variable, what should the debugger do? Uh, that can be a difficult problem. Uh, <clears throat> you could say that, oh, just run the debugger on the unoptimized code. But that may not be such a good solution because you know that when you do a mistake, let's say in C, you uh, have an array with three elements, and then you uh, this is a, and then you set element seven to something. What happens in C then? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here, you write nine. And what happens with your program depends on what happened to be stored in this location. If it turns out to be outside of allocated memory, you might get a segmentation fault and a crash. If nothing important is saved here, maybe it's unused space, then nothing happens. If it was an important variable, then that variable will change its value. And the interesting thing here is that <coughs> the layout of the memory may very well change completely depending on if you have optimized the code or not. This variable that I just overwrote with my 9 here might have disappeared completely in the optimized code. So I want to debug the optimized code. Okay. Um, I was going to talk about the code generator. Now I have less than two minutes to talk about the code generator. Uh, let me just say one thing about, or two things about the code generator. <coughs> if you have a code generator that generates uh, machine code for an actual physical processor, uh, you might generate machine code or, which is more common, assembler code, so you have to run it through an assembler. Uh, but it needs to do two things. The first is to choose instructions. And <coughs> some processors have nice instructions for loops. Maybe you have an, a single instruction that sets you, lets you copy an entire block of memory. So should you choose that instruction or should you use uh, a normal loop. That is the first thing, choose the correct instructions. And then register allocation. You know that the CPU has a number of registers which are very fast memory, uh, but limited. Maybe you have 10 registers in a CPU. And you need, you want to put as, you want to use those registers as heavily as possible for your variables. So you don't have to go out into main memory, which is fast, but not as fast as registers. You need to, you want to put as, mo, uh, as much, <coughs> as many variables as possible uh, that are used heavily in your uh, function in registers. And, uh, finding which registers to use for which variables is also an important part of what the code generator does. Okay, that's all I have to say about the code generator. So, thank you for today, and if you have questions, I will be here for a while. Okay, thank you. Hello.